Okay, hello, and thank you for joining us for our final Xylazine webinar. As you may know, PARI partnered with Brandeis University and Thomas Jefferson University this year to create a community intervention to Xylazine. There were three stages to this project, and during the first stage, Thomas Jefferson University conducted fo focus groups with people who use drugs and clinicians that support people who use drugs. In the second stage, PARI, Brandeis, and Thomas Jefferson conducted three webinars for public safety officers to inform them about what xylazine is, where it comes from, and how the overdose response is different uh, when fentanyl and xylazine are both present versus fentanyl alone. And if you're interested in watching this webinar, it is on our website, and my team member, Amanda, will be dropping the link in the chat. Amanda will also be dropping a link in the chat to all the follow-up materials from those webinars. In the third stage of this project, Pari, Brandeis, and Thomas Jefferson University conducted workshops with 10 communities in the Northeast to create their own community intervention to xylazine. And members of three of these communities are joining us today. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, just to share what they've learned and what they've done since the workshop. But first, we're going to hand it over to nurse Jason Biennert to discuss xylazine, xylazine wound care. So Jason was a wound care nurse in Elkton, Maryland before joining John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health as a senior re research nurse this summer. He has more than 10 years of experience in critical care nursing, nursing leadership, and critical wound care. And over the past three years, he has treated hundreds of xylazine wounds and led the development and implementation of a wound care program in Maryland called Voices of Hope. We met Jason at the beginning of this project before he started in his role with John Hopkins and created a couple of videos about xylazine wound care and xylazine overdose response. And we'll be sharing both of those videos after the webinar. So if there's other folks in your network that you think should see them, um, feel free to forward them along. And as a bit of additional background, the epicenter of this crisis, if you missed our first web webinars, um, is in the US in Philadelphia. And Elkton, Maryland is about an hour from Philadelphia. And the presence of xylazine in the community has been slightly slower than that of Philadelphia, but as a result, Jason has been able to figure out exactly how to address xylazine is in his community with a little bit more time. So now I'm going to pass it off to Jason to discuss wound care. Jason. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me back. Um, this is this is actually pretty exciting. Um, if you have if you did have the chance to watch the first one, um, Wound care with xylazine, I, we, we kind of figured out slowly was um, it's all about early intervention, getting their, uh, getting your participants to recognize what's happening, getting your participants to um, uh, recognize that, you know, these little blue spots on their arms are actually wounds and, and will grow into something worse that's that was the i guess the key or the surprise for us is that early intervention keeping them covered and moist actually has a profound impact over the longevity of these wounds um left uncovered and left you know to do its own thing these wounds can last for months um you've seen the horror stories online the worst case scenarios always make the pictures these huge uh, like awful rattled arms and legs, but in, in reality, they all start with just one little spot. And that's something we all got to keep in mind. Um, and I wanted to kind of update on what's happened since then, since the beginning of this project. Um, when we first started, there wasn't a ton of research. Since then, the market's been flooded with a lot of case research, like case by case. Um, I've spent the past like couple of weeks going through a whole bunch of research. But the reality is we're still missing some really bread and butter parts of this that that's necessary, at least from my eyes. Like today, as we speak, we don't know why the wounds happen. There's a lot of hypothetical reasons. There's a lot of people saying that th this should be the way. But the reality is nobody can answer all the questions. Um, right now in Utah, to the best of my knowledge, there's some studies going on molecularly, like looking at the cellular, like what's happening intracellularly to this stuff um and that's going to be some some changing information as to like really why the wounds happen and the reason i even bring this up is because we're treating things without really even knowing the cause of it um we know the drug causes the wound and we're assuming a lot of things but in, in reality it doesn't matter we're, we're just treating the person and 
and the wound kind of comes with it. Uh, in those three years developing the wound care program, the thing I really took away was I did a lot less of the shoulder work and heavy lifting when the participants were aware of what was going on and how to take care of themselves. That self-care part was, um, I guess, the, the, the part that I wasn't anticipating as a nurse, because most times in nursing, we do things to you, not with you. And by turning the tides and doing things with people, it was pretty profound. Um, some other updates is that we've recently discovered that xylazine binds to some um, opioid receptors in the brain, which was pretty new information within the past, I think, month that came out from uh, University of North Carolina researching team. Um, so that it doesn't change anything, but that's that's actually pretty pretty new information. And we're also learning a little bit more about the the actual true effects in the brain on the um, like norepi and epinephrine, like how it affects the brain. And it kind of goes back into like there, there's a separate withdrawal from xylazine that we're not really um, able to address yet. And hopefully we're on the the brink of figuring out how to address that for people that are in treatment. Um, people that are at MAT clinics and people jet after that first, you know, you get them stable dose and they're still uncomfortable. You can't raise them anymore. And they're still leaving that we're going to figure that out. I have faith in the scientific community. Um, this movement seems like from the ground up, it's happening in harm reduction organizations that are actually helping the research community. This is slightly different in my experience in the past. That's how I ended up working at Bloomberg was my harm reduction skills. Um, a researcher said, I want those skills in a, to, I want to watch what you do with people and how you do it so we can share it with other people. Um, and then with, with a lot of this, and I know the, the whole back bend of this is, is with the, you know, the, the police um, addiction and recovery initiative stuff. It's, the other part that I'm seeing is people are contacting me from around the country talking about like, are these xylazine wounds, are these xylazine wounds? And, and most times they are. And the one thing I find that I'm saying, and this is really different for me from the from last time I actually talked to you guys, I'm actually suggesting partnering up with law enforcement with this. Um, all of the harm reduction groups, I'm like, you need to know the people in your neighborhood. And I know I'm showing my age with Sesame Street, but it's that old Sesame Street song, like who are the people in your neighborhood? I, my new stance on this is that it's, it takes a village and we all need to work together. For so long, the harm reduction community has been isolated as kind of the, the black sheep of public health. And then there's the public health community and health departments. And then you have the, the MET health bubble helping people, but they're still stuck in, you know, in their world of, you know, providing buprenorphine or methadone. Um, I think we all need to know each other because I've now been called by like bup clinics to identify wounds. I was talking to a harm reduction group. And if, when law enforcement drops someone off at your doorstep, and I talked about this in my first video, if there was a woman they dropped off to us because they could trust us. I went back and did some investigation after talking to you guys about who the officer was that dropped them off, what the backstory of that person was. Um, and that person has a loved one in recovery. They, they have a sibling in recovery. So understanding that, you know, we for the longest time kind of push police away, push law enforcement away because they're trying to arrest our participants, but our participants are breaking the law nonetheless. It's understanding the human side of addiction and understanding that addiction actually hits everybody now. Um, reaching out to law enforcement has been a, a actual valuable tool. It, it actually ended up with our organization being invited into a lot of circles we would not have been invited into. Um, like uh, we were already part of the overdose review board, but we never invited in the inner circle of this for our county. And then we were. Um, we were sitting there with the school board and everybody was talking about how we can help the community. And that really came from partnership across the, the let's say across the aisle and two unlikely friends. When the police, when police would come to an area and see someone with a wound, I, I would get a call from an officer saying, hey, look, you know, we just went over to a disturbance over so-and-so. Um, there's, there's someone with a wound that 
said they didn't know your organization, um, can you go check on them? Like they fit your MO, they fit you, they fit your, uh, your, your typical, you know, client or whatever. That was, that came from relationship building. That was something that wasn't there when I first started. And that came from taking a lot of heat from the sheriff. It came from taking a lot of standing in front of a lot of people. I'd never thought I'd stand in front of saying that these are human beings. These people with holes in their body shouldn't be arrested. The hospital doesn't know what to do with them yet. Send them our way. We'll get them to the hospital if they need to. We'll get them to the right hospital. Um, Elkton is about an hour away. It's, it's equidistant from Philly as it is from Baltimore. It's easier to get to Baltimore though um, for the medical system. University of Maryland, Hopkins, they have a lot of specialty clinics for soft tissue stuff. Specialists abound in this area. Taking them to local community hospital just means they're going to get treated and treated immediately. They're going to leave from the emergency room. The relationship we built allowed people to get actual medical care that was advanced in a timely fashion. And I don't know if it was above water or below. I don't know if what we did was legal, them sharing names and locations. It probably wasn't. Um, but I can tell you this, we've saved limbs because of this kind of contact. EMTs would call and suggest, hey, look, we saw somebody with a wound. Um, they had some of they had some of your organizations like syringe uh, stuff there. So we know you know them. Um, you know, like Johnny or Tommy, yeah, 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 go check them out. And because of this relationship with these other organizations that were not really natural to start, because we built them up, we were able to actually help people. We saved fingers. Um, we actually got medical care to people that needed it, that wouldn't get it in the community, that refused treatment, but allowed like a paramedic to, to share their name with me. That's kind of crazy. Um, law enforcement would actually hand our card out to folks that were appropriate and it would have my number and phone number on the back i it this it means like this whole organization this whole process means a lot to me um my dad was a state trooper and he's long gone and that was a, a life i didn't know as a child um he had a different profession when when i was a kid it was before i was born but apparently we, we both had the same mo like everybody has bad days some days are worse than others and you judge a person by their character and you help them when they need it most um you can't arrest this problem like this problem's ongoing and all you can do in my mind and you know hopefully i i'm shining a light from a dad all you can do is help the person that's sitting in front of you and hope that you helping them can help strengthen your community because you'll no longer be that that obnoxious police officer that just hassles, you know, drug addicts or junkies. Um, you'll, you'll be that guy that understands what addiction is or that, that, you know, that trooper that understands what addiction is like, Oh yeah, that police officer, she really understood where I was coming from and, you know, was able to get me help instead of getting me arrested, getting me unable to get any kind of, you know, benefits for like schools and stuff like that, like all that stuff. It's, this is kind of a softening across the board. Um, I didn't think working with Pari in the beginning would have had any kind of mental effect, but my initial instinct with this was, you know, like, oh yeah, it's law enforcement stuff. This is just another federal program no one cares about. And then once I actually heard other people that had watched the video I did or said, that, oh, there's a law enforcement agency that's involved with this, or, you know, they heard about it. Um, it, it warms my heart knowing that in all of America today, everybody has a bad chip on their shoulder, like law enforcement's the worst thing that ever happened, or you know, addiction medicine's terrible. But seeing this crossover and and organizations like this actually pushing forward, it's it's necessary. Um, wounds are just part of the problem. Xylazine wounds are a fraction of the real issue. The the issue is we have a really sick young community. Um, if we want to rebuild and actually become like a uh, substantial, if you want your community to be substantial again, like we have to rebuild the community brick by brick. And that means the sick ones too. So that's, you know, I know this is supposed to be about wound care and stuff, but the other part of, you know, I sat down this morning trying to write some key points. The other part of all of this that I really came out not understanding that was important and this might not be legal in some of the states i'm talking to is drug checking and i'm i'm speaking about beyond the the fentanyl test strips and the xylazine test strips 
I'm talking about drug checking on like the collegiate level where a university would do it um, or actually harm reduction organizations. It's, it's controversial. Everything in the harm reduction world is controversial. The reality is drug checking makes for a safer community and can actually stave off overdose. You can catch the trends. Maryland has a drug checking system now with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, and we're able to send in supplies to them. And within, it's like a week and a half, we get results. Part of the study I'm working on is putting a, a not as quality as NIST, but putting a, a, a machine into the community and checking drugs when people come onto our van. So I'm providing wound care, um, drug checking. It requires a technician and a lot of training, but what we're seeing is people care about what they're putting in their body. Is it gonna change what they're doing today? No, because they already bought it. What is gonna change is where they go back tomorrow. And people are, are re-upping where they're like, oh, this has xylazine in it. Well, I'm gonna go somewhere else tomorrow. No one's gonna give up what they had today, you know, and because they spent their 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 money on that. But I, I foresee drug checking coming to your communities. If you're not aware of it, let me be the first face to ever say it to you guys. Um, it, it's a push I think that is actually saving people. And with that being said, like I, I I'm I really appreciate you guys asking me back for this. It means a lot. It means a lot to talk to law enforcement. I believe in bridging these gaps. I, there's harm reductionists across the country that would put a spear in my head right now for saying that. Um, but I was talking to LA yesterday. I was like, you need to make friends with your police officers. I was like, you will find the hearts in all of them. I was like, there's jerks and there's hearts. You find them in hospitals with nurses and doctors. You find them everywhere. Like everywhere there's good and bad. Like, don't turn everybody off because you think you're too cool for school. Like, you need to bridge those gaps, communicate with law enforcement, um, and you'll find that there's mutual respect. They give you room and you realize you're actually taking care of somebody and not just, you know, a, a pain in their behinds. But thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. So we're going to give the audience uh, a chance to ask any questions. I know you covered wound care right at the top, um, and I know you have, like, a uh, the a perfect three step process. Could you could you repeat that one more time? So it's wound care is really simple. You mm. basically assess the wound. If, if it's wet, you need to make it dry or dry it up. If it's dry, you need to make it moist. And that word moist, I hated it in the beginning. And that moist is a weird word to say, but moisture is so imperative. It, it's the most important part of wound healing. And if if it's infected, you need to treat and reassess. Those three steps were taught to me by by my mentor in wound care and street medicine, and it, she she was a lot to me. Um, and it was the simplest thing. I spent thousands on education, and that really is what it come down to: moisture control in a wound. These wounds are dry; they're dead tissue, and they dries out almost like mummified tissue. If you keep it moist early, that early intervention I was talking about, Vaseline and a band aid over these little purple spots. When they open, they'll remain moist. When they're moist, they heal. When they dry, it's a cork. It keeps it open. Um, and this is the early wounds. When you find folks with the big craterous wounds, that's a whole, the idea is the same, but it's a whole different level of needs. The needs change, the, the worse the wound gets. But the idea remains the same. Um, that's what, you know, the Band-Aid commercials with Neosporin, all that stuff. Neosporin keeps the wound moist. It's not the antibiotics that help you heal fast. It's the carrier that it's in. Um, Band-Aids keep it covered. So you're, you're keeping moisture and heat inside the wound and not letting the wound dry out or, or you know, change temperature too much. Um, all of these things, it's such simple wound care. It goes back to like, you know, the 1800s and early medicine. It's this is frontier medicine or civil war kind of stuff. Keep it covered, keep it moist, do your best to keep it clean. I'm not a stickler. I'm not one of the nurses that scrub stuff. If people have a way to clean, let them clean it. If they don't, that's fine. Keeping it moist provides more benefit than trying to figure a way to hurt them and scrub their wounds. Um, and that's, that's kind of like, even my certification board would probably roll over dead if I summed up wound care and that, but that's really what it is. All wound care circumvents and the millions of products and millions of dollars, billions of dollars spent on wound care. It's all about moisture balance, um, keeping it covered and and 
the, the freedom to remove the dressing as opposed to the body making a scab. Um, that that's what all the dressings do. You, like, we're providing a scab, quote unquote, at, with the dressing. It, it's moisture balance. So with xylosine wounds, they're not infected to start. They're clean. It, it's an insult to the body from the drug. We don't know why it happens, but whatever it is, it's still clean. It's not bacteria. These wounds have a tendency not to get infected until later stages when they're left uncovered and people just keep injecting around the edges and they kind of fester. That's when they kind of snowball into complications. But other than that, it's, it's yeah, it's about moisture balance, um, keeping it right in that middle zone moist <laughs> awesome um so somebody asked uh francis asked when when will you start seeing the wounds appearing so if, if somebody is using um with uh drugs with xylazine when will you expect to see these wounds that's a really good question so the issue with this and this is where it kind of gets sticky they don't it, it's we know that it probably you notice what i'm saying probably has something to do with the the percent of xylazine in the the drug um in your combo uh thing with your fentanyl and people have a tendency to some people don't react to it at all they'll never get a wound the population that we saw it was predominantly women with wounds more than men um the men's wounds were worse because they have a tendency to let them go longer before they ask for help uh, but women have a tendency to get the spots sooner and it can be like, we had one person inject and they almost instantaneously appeared. Another person would inject in three to five hours, they would show up or overnight they would appear. If people get them at the injection site, they tend to pop up sooner. The weird part about xylazine that kind of debuffs all of this, the hypothetical reasons why the wounds happen is that they can occur in non-injection sites. So you can inject in your left arm and get a wound on your leg. Um, and those, those can pop up overnight. I, most times people are saying like they inject and the next day they find it because they don't hurt either. There's a lot of conflicting information. All of our participants that have these small spots say they don't hurt. They don't even know they're there. Um, you, they really have to just check their skin and they see this purple spot. And all of a sudden, you know, in a day, it's like a blister, it opens and then it's a, it's dead tissue. Um, nobody really complains about pain with these until they get big oh that's really interesting so so uh margie asked is vaseline the best not an antibiotic for keeping it moist i love it so i i'm i have a very simple solution when i first got on board with this job they allowed me to like order whatever i wanted and i went like a like a kid in a candy store i, I was like oh i want this and that it really got, I dumbed it down to like four products in my trunk and it all became out of the back of my Mazda. Um, because they, they also ordered a 30 day foot camper that said we do recover on the side of it and nobody wants that in their front yard when they're doing drugs. I'll just tell you that much. Um, so the Mazda, the trunk of my Mazda had roll gauze, Coban, which is adhesive gauze that sticks to itself, ABD pads and zero form, which is a linen with Vaseline and bismuth impregnated. Um, we have used, so since all of these things and, and talking to people, we've tried different things. Stretchy t-shirts don't work that well. Old tea towels with no elasticity, that's thin cotton um, that you can kind of hold up and see light through, they work well. That's very similar to what Zero Form is. And it's it was easier for us just to buy zero form than it was to to manufacture the the mom and pop stuff but yeah vaseline with a cover dressing that's all you got that's fantastic um until these wounds open and become a problem they're not infected so that keeping that heavily hydrated vaseline works great and it's cheap love that we love cheap options for uh you know community work cost so effective. <laughs> <laughs> cost effective um, so, uh, Keith asks, and I'm sorry, I'm about to butcher this, these words, is there vascular involvement, vasculitis, endothelial damage? Yes. So we're, we're not sure about the, the actual endothelial stuff with the vascular system. Um, there's some rumor that people have seen it on biopsies, but they're, what I'm finding are more complicated. People that get them in the upper limbs, it's a lot easier. People that have had years of drug use that have them, 
that start to get them on their legs or inject into the legs and get them around their injection sites, that is triggering uh, venous insufficiency issues. Their legs are swelling. They're getting sw like super swollen. They're draining a tremendous amount, which is making the wounds bigger, which is complicating the whole mess. So with your participants that inject in the legs that have damaged veins and they start showing signs with edema and leaky legs, it that is those are the folks that need to go to a wound center to get like venous compression wraps, which is like something advanced that I, I, you can't do in the field. Um, and it takes a compliant patient because it's addressing they have to return back back and forth to. There really isn't a good solution. The makeshift solution, if you have non participatory participants, ones that don't want to go back to the hospital or the, the wound center, baby diapers with um, ACE bandages, but you're only patching it. You're only absorbing the moisture coming out. You're not solving the problem. Those folks need compression to support the, the expansion of the tissue and stuff. But as far as the actual vascular nature, like what's happening in the, like the microvascular system, um, they believe there's some issue going on, but they're not sure. I, I have a tendency to I don't want to say it, but I have a tendency to lean more towards like the vasculitis issue with the, why the wounds happen in different parts of the body, but I don't want to put my stamp on it officially. I love that. Thanks, Jason. So um, Michelle asks, do you have a website or anything that shows examples of what these wounds look like? Michelle, we will send around a video that we made with Jason that actually has pictures of these wounds in several um, stages so that would give you a better idea. And Jason, if you have any other um, resources that you would suggest for our uh, our watchers of this video today, um, if you want to send them to me, I can send them out. And then um, Nicole says, I'm ordering Xylazine wound care kits for our community. This is what's on my list. I know you said Vaseline is A and D okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. K-L-I-N-G, Kling? Yeah, Kling, perfect. Okay, great. Um, I also see, why does this appear so different in humans than animals? Vets routinely use this drug. What's the difference? So my wife works in veterinary medicine, and this has been the bi biggest battle between she and I. Um, she uses it for bunnies, and because um, she works in exotics, uh, they, like she sees exotics and stuff. There, I had her do a deep dive for me. There is one reference that we found in veterinary literature that's um, it's somewhat dated. I think that it was from the 80s about that you can't use it in hoof stock, especially horses with laminitis because it'll create ulcers. But that's the only reference we found with it. So in animals, in large animals, it can create issues when you already have an inflammatory process occurring. Um, small animals, there's none. Uh, I have, I like I said, there's a lot of reasons people think these wounds happen. I have my own theory. I think it's immune system issue with, with some vasculitis or something else occurring that we're going to need to see on the molecular level to see your immune media, like what your body's doing to it. I think some animals and most animals have different immune systems than we do, and that kind of plays into it. Um, but it also, it also could go the route of uh, most animals don't have vascular and arterial issues like humans do. Like we're terrible with our bodies. Um, animals just do animal stuff. And, um, you know, they don't smoke. They don't live in, you know, they, they eat grass or they eat feed. And they're not really dying of heart attacks like humans are. Um, so it, it still could go back to just pure vascular vasoconstriction, which is one theory of why it happens. But it doesn't explain why it happens throughout the body. I wish we knew more. Um, there are some studies going on now with trying to induce wounds with direct injection, which I, I don't condone animal testing like that, um, which I, I don't really talk much about it, but I know of some studies going on now um, in the Midwest somewhere about doing, trying to induce wounds in pig skin and stuff. Um, no. All right, so we'll take one more question, which is from Mila, she says, we have many clients at our opioid treatment center, center that are smoking fentanyl blues cut with xylazine. Any idea how quickly the spots or wounds start to show up when a person has been smoking? 
So that's really interesting. Smoking, it depends on how they're smoking it. Um, in Philly and some places in New York, uh, a hammer pipe, which is a type of um, uh, glass smoking device that can handle high heat, this goes into the chemistry of it. Some say that you heat it up enough to break down the xylazine effect and or break down xylazine with the, your butane lighter, but not break down fentanyl. Um, most people don't go through that kind of rigmarole to smoke it. There is some theory that the wounds aren't as prevalent when you smoke it, and that could have to he be with heat degradation of the, of the drug itself. Um, a lot of what we're finding, it has to do with direct contact with the 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 drug itself with mucous membranes when you snort it when you're using it intrarectally and intravaginally um smoking is that weird enigma it's regional and i i personally don't have experience with it we couldn't get any of our participants to even try it um a lot of our participants liken smoking it to smoking crack and they they had a hard time getting off a of crack they don't want to go back to that as well um that but that's because i'm in a rural community uh, Baltimore City, where I'm at right now, um, it, it's not prevalent smoking either. If it is, it's in pockets that I'm unaware of. Awesome. I, don't think the wound, I don't think the wounds are as prevalent with smoking. And if you go by what the percentage of xylazine, the wounds, they if they appear anywhere, they're obviously going to appear throughout the body. I don't think they're going to appear quite as fast, probably because the concentration hits the body differently, if I had to guess on it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for being here today. We really appreciate your participation back in, uh, I think it was April when we first saw you and six months later, um, giving us that update today. I know, like you said, this is an emerging threat. And so there's new data every day, every, every month. So thank you very much for coming and giving us this update. And also for advocating for two things, which we have advocated for um, in this project. One, working together, public health and public safety and really um, making sure that, you know, people are not working in silos and drug checking, which um, we are, this is a perfect segue. It was like you set us up for Kevin. Um, so um, <clears throat> as I mentioned at the top of the hour, as part of this project, we held workshops with 10 Northeastern communities and each workshop included a mix of public safety officers and community groups working together to create an intervention for their community around xylazine. Workshops included public health departments, police, fire, harm reduction organization, overdose follow-up groups, faith-based organization, hospital employees, and more. And um, just a little bit about the workshop. The day started with an overview of xylazine. Then we discussed drug checking and change responses to overdoses. Results from the focus groups um, with from Thomas Jefferson of people who use drugs and then a review of suggested community interventions. From there, we broke into groups and we brainstormed the community's current resources and response. And then in those same groups, community members chose interventions to, per to pursue following the workshop. Uh, before I turn the mic over to our first department, I thought I would just read through some of the interventions we suggested as possibilities for these communities. So. Uh, we suggested create a community awareness about the potential effects of xylazine, map local resources for wound care, adapt overdose response protocols for fentanyl xylazine co-exposure, create updated protocols to observe individuals experience extended profound sedation due to xylazine exposure, collect and send local drug samples to drug checking programs, monitor skin ulcerations and amputation statistics at, at local emergency departments, provide safer drug use materials, uh, provide wound care education for people who use drugs, provide additional training to police officers and other first responders, assemble and distribute wound care kits, identify local healthcare programs and professionals that have expertise in fentanyl withdrawal protocols and medication treatments for opioids, and then encourage that they seek training on xylazine withdrawal and treatment. With all of that said, um, those were the interventions we suggested, and I'm going to pass it off to Deputy Chief Kevin Lowley of the Augusta, Maine Police Department to introduce himself and talk a little bit more about what his community has seen and what they've done following the workshops we held with them. Uh, Chief Lowley? Uh, Chief Lowley, I think you're on mute.
Uh oh. I see him, but it looks like he's on mute. Um, so we'll we'll actually skip him for the moment, and I'll skip to uh, Officer Ted Lane, who is a community impact officer at the Beverly Police Department. Officer Lane, do you mind uh, introducing yourself and then sharing a little bit more about what the Beverly Police Department is doing to address xylazine following your workshop? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here, Zoe. This is a, quite an honor. Um, I'm a community impact officer in Beverly, Massachusetts. Beverly is a city of about 45,000 people. We're located on the North Shore of Massachusetts, right on the coast. We're located between Gloucester and Lynn, which are two uh, probably much busier cities than Beverly itself. So um, although we don't see a big xylazine problem immediately in our city, we have seen it test positive in those two cities. So pretty much anything going between the two of us, the, between those two cities is coming through Beverly. So it's just probably a matter of time. So in our focus group, when we were met a couple months ago, Gosh, that was about back in the summer now, seems like ages ago. Our, our focus was probably mostly awareness. I think there's just um, working with different um, the health department, working with the hospitals, working with the paramedics, one stop, which is one of our harm care reduction people, just, just getting the information out there. So our first thing we started off doing was a more of a social media campaign, um, working with Be Healthy Beverly, which is um, part of our Greater, Be uh, Greater Beverly YMCA, and just getting some information out there. Pari provided that great one page sheet that has information. And I think that's uh, the most that people can take all at once. So we kind of put that um, one pager out there, get that information out to people. My next step was to start working with the uh, Beverly Hospital. I got in touch with the nurse educator in the emergency department there. And the I know from my wife works in the emergency department there and they didn't have any knowledge about xylazine at all. So working with the nurse educator, again, the with the information that Pari provided, getting that one pager out there, kind of something that the nursing staff could look at, get a lot of knowledge quickly. But um, we've talked about meeting a little bit more, trying to do the um, xylazine 101 PowerPoint, trying to get a little bit more information to the nurses, but starting off simple with just that one pager, getting the stuff out there. Our next thing that we did is we worked a lot with uh, a harm reduction program called One Stop, and we work with more of a recovery um, program, which is Essex County Outreach. So usually our uh, harm reduction people go out immediately after, within 24 to 72 hours after an overdose. We're going and giving the wound care kits, giving the Narcan, working with them. Our health department has also worked with One Stop to provide um, the van. I know it's uh, not the back of, was it a Nissan that Jason said he was working out of? I forget, but uh, you know, we do have, One Stop has a van that is, has some time in the city now and they're doing you know, wound care information. They're also you know, doing some STI testing, other, other things. So it's great to have them in the city. Uh, one of the big things I'm doing is Narcan training, and part of my Narcan training was not just with the police department. I started off, I've been a paramedic prior to being a police officer for many years, so I've been doing the training with that, but I added in a couple of slides about Narcan training, and now I'm doing a lot of training in the city. Just um, It started off with just different departments in the city. I did the library, uh, went to the YMCA, but now we're starting to get requests from some of the local churches, just that have groups of people that um, may see clients that have more of these issues, so they want to be more aware of it. So really, you know, I've obviously talking mostly about Narcan, but emphasizing a, a portion on xylazine so that they're aware of that. One other thing that I did with I work in our community impact unit is um, our jail diversion clinician. And she and I did a thing at the Cabot Theater, which is a historic theater here in Beverly. And they had what they called a community conversation on um, substance use disorders. And they kind of, we were allowed to like pre-pick some of the questions a little bit. So we did have a question. I kind of threw one in there on xylazine so that we could get that information out there. And that was, uh, it wasn't overly, I was hoping there'd be a lot more people there. There's probably about 75 people there, but it was also put on our um, local Beverly Access Cable show. So hopefully more people saw it than just the 75 people that were there. And then actually right now um, in my paramedic refresher, I had to 
run upstairs from that. And I was talking to the instructor from that. And I was like, hey, you know, are you going to talk about xylazine at all in this paramedic refresher? And he's like, oh, and he's a paramedic educator, nurse, works in, you know, a lot of the hospitals in the area. And they're not even as familiar with it. So I sent him a bunch of information from you guys, the one pager, the um, xylazine 101 PowerPoint presentation and everything so that hopefully we can start getting that information to the first responders, the paramedics, EMTs and everything. So try and get out that out there. So that's been what we've been working on mostly, just trying to awareness. I can't say that we have any definite cases of xylazine. Um, I know that we are doing some drug checking with Brandeis and that they've tested it in Lynn in Beverly, but I don't know that it's actually popped positive here in Beverly, but I did give out one wound care kit for someone who had a wound, but I wasn't really convinced that it was due to xylazine. I think he might've had a wound from something else, but the wound care kit still came in handy. So we appreciate, again, everything that you guys gave us for that. So that's a lot of stuff that we're using. So that's about awesome. it. Awesome. Well, that's a lot. So thank <laughs> you so much, Officer Lane, for coming on today and for sharing. And I think you had some great ideas that other communities could definitely implement. I mean, just including this information as they're out in the community is really a huge step forward for a lot of a lot of communities. So um, I'm Thank gonna you. I'm gonna pass it off now to Lysandra Gonzalez from the New Bedford Police Department. Lysandra, do you mind introducing yourself a, a little bit before you share about what your department is doing on xylazine following the workshop? Sure, good afternoon. My name is Lisandra Gonzalez. I am the assistant program coordinator for the LEAD and the outreach programs, as well as the mental health unit here with the New Bedford Police Department. And I am covering for Natasha, so I hope to make her proud today. <laughs> but you know, it's her stuff. <laughs> so um, since we had the um, design scene training with Harry and we had our meeting, um, was a month, two months ago, right? Somewhere around there. Um, we're a very busy department, um, and so we work, we have very good relationships with a lot of community partners. And so our, uh, we, I'm gonna start with the post overdose um, outreach team. So we have a post overdose uh, team that has been established in 2018. And so we just were able to um, reinforce that team with the silencing information. And so Harry was able to get us these cards that we have been able to hand out that had the status and information in the back. And those have been so helpful because um, it has our contact information. It has just, just enough information on the back to be um, straight and to the point. And so when the officers go out with the clergy members and with the outreach um, worker and the police officers to do the post over those visits, um, after someone um, overdoses, they're able to just have those very brief conversations about these things. And so they hand out Narcan, they touch base with the person who has um, who had the overdose ep um, episode, as well as with any family members who are present. And so it's, it's very convenient to just have that, just like that one little thing that you can just hand to someone and has just enough information to either make them curious about it or just hand out enough information to be aware about these things. Um, we have a lot of outreach things in the community. And so Natasha wasn't able to be here today because she actually runs a outreach team, I believe it's once or twice a month, uh, where all the outreach workers come together to see and to talk about all the things that are happening in the community. So uh, these outreach teams come from all different agencies. And so they're all seeing either some of the same people or some new people. And so they're able to discuss what are the trends that they're seeing in the community. Um, they, so they're starting to see some asylum, they're starting to see um, some wounds. So it was convenient to have the wound kits that um, the Perry had given to us um, during that training because they're able to share that with the community. And when they, out, they had a September meeting and in the September meeting, the outreach teams were sharing that people are starting to hear the information about xylazine. And so they were hearing that right in the community. So the information is being shared. Um, you know, the, the wound kids are being um, are passed out in the community. Um, and so we know at least for a fact that people are hearing the same message from everyone, which is good. Um, we're lucky that we we have a very close relationship with the health department in New Bedford. 
And so we received um, a, a large dose of uh, NICAN to train our first responders, to train the police officers. And so um, Natasha and I set up um, trainings that were specific to the police officers. And so while they were very familiar with the fentanyl response and they were very familiar with the with how to handle an overdose and provide the Narcan, they were not familiar with the xylazine. And so a lot of them, for them, they were hearing that message for the first time. Um, and it was, how, well, how do we respond to the xylazine overdose and when, what happens? And when, if they don't wake up, they just keep Narcan and not realizing that um, that was not the proper response to the xylazine overdose. And so um, it was it was interesting to see how um, how they were receiving the information, they um, it was it was nice to see that they were very responsive to it. That it was like, oh, okay, so you know, then what do we do? They were curious. They were asking questions. They were very engaged. Um, I had I wish that I had thought about it before. We actually printed some pictures from the internet as to what the wounds might look like on different stages, and so they were able to see the progression of that. And um, you know, and for us, we we had to find a way of relating to them. And it was like, well, you remember, you know, years ago when Crocodile came out and, you know, those were some of those, uh, you know, wounds that kind of look like that. These are a little bit different. This would be how people treat them. Um, some of them were like, well, we're not providing the care for this. No, you just, if you need help, you know, you give us the these are, So we put those little cards right in the Nakia. Um, and it's like, you know, our card is right in here. You know, you give us a call if you need anything, if you need wound care. So our officers are very good about um, sending emails to our team when they need something, when they need to make a referral, when they're concerned about a citizen, because they know their people. They see people constantly. Um, a lot of times if they're seeing the same, they're responding to the same overdoses, they're responding to the same um, individuals. And so they know that we're that our, our reach team is here. And so they'll send us an email, hey, listen, we saw so-and-so yesterday. You may want to touch base with that family. Same thing with the mental health um, team. If they're seeing someone who is a consistent on a frequent flyer, they'll be like, hey, listen, we just saw this person yesterday. They were in the community. They may need help. Yes, an email. Just let us know. Um, and we just update them. So we have a very close relationship. Um, I'm just trying to think, make sure that we don't miss anything. So, so when Jason said that, you know, that you uh, there's a value in creating a relationship between law enforcement and what we do as outreach teams and as outreach workers, there's truly a value there. Um, with the police department, you know, there's there's a set, certain culture a lot of times, and as you develop the um the relationship, you can see sometimes those cultures shifting. Um, they, you know, they start seeing things from a different perspective or you're providing that education that a lot of times they may not see it that way. Um, it's just sometimes either a lack of a, a lot of information or they're so used to doing things in a certain way and you're just teaching them a different way of doing things. So it's just an added value to what they already do because they do a lot and they go from call to call to call to call. And a lot of times it's just having that time to process what they're doing. Um, so for us, it's been it's been a really good experience to see that happening. Um, also, our health department, our health department has started um, handing out silencing test strips. Um, we don't have a lot in the community of the silencing um, test strips, but we do. And what they have, they are actually sharing in the community, which is really nice. So, um, and we don't, I know I read something about the false positives. Sometimes it's better to have a false positive than have nothing at all. So it's like, you know, do we not test because, you know, that maybe we may have a false positive. It's, it's better to just test if you have it. Um, they, some people have started creating their own um, wound care kits, which we encourage if you have it, pass it out. Um, and the same thing with the police officers. If they need anything, we try to be their, their go-to resource. If we don't have it, we will find it. If we don't have it, we will create it just so that they have those resources available. So um, it's, it, we can see those, the, our relationships in the community are growing. Um, you know, we're trying to pass on more trainings. We're trying to make things available. As We're trying to not recreate the wheel, but make things easier and more accessible to people in the community. So I appreciate you ending with that because there was one question I had for you. I know that you, um, New Bedford has a large Spanish speaking and Portuguese speaking. Population. 
Have you guys done any sort of um, translating of the materials of any of the xylazine materials? So that's one thing that um, that I know that Natasha had a question on, and I know that we were working with, I believe it's Luz at the health department, and she had offered to do some of that stuff for us. Um, and like I said, we have really good relationships with um, the health department as well as the other agencies. And for us, you know, like I speak Spanish, Natasha speaks Portuguese. So even when we're outreach, even if we have no one else in the staff that may be able to do a visit or a post over those visit, I can reach out to the Spanish community and Natasha can reach out to the Portuguese community. So we try as much as we can to make it as easy as possible. That's really awesome. I love yeah, that. Right. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to give Kevin one more uh, opportunity to come off mute if you're there. Uh, Deputy Chief Lilly, are you there? I think I think he may be uh, facing technical difficulties. Okay, well, I appreciate everybody for being here today. Thank you to our guest speakers for coming and sharing. Um, we're going to send everybody who attended this webinar or even registered for this webinar a bunch of resources, <clears throat> sorry, all the resources that we had from our PARI 101 webinar, or not, sorry, not PARI 101, Xylazine 101 webinar, and all of the resources from our um, workshop, uh, which includes one pagers, the videos, uh, Jason's videos on wound care, and um, several other things. So. We'll send that all in a follow-up email. Again, thank you everybody for being here and a special thanks for our guest speakers. Thanks everybody.